Welcome to the Web Platform Podcast, a developer discussion that dives deep into all things web. We discuss topics relevant to developing for the modern web and the web platform of today, tomorrow, and beyond. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Web Platform Podcast. Episode number 176. Today we're talking about Visbug. We are your hosts this week, Leon, Justin, Eric, and Danny. Gentlemen, hello. Hi. Hello, Justin. Hello. It's a week after CDS. Uh, uh, I feel that recovery is imminent this week, but it's hard to tell at this point. It's, it's, all, it's all still very much <laughs> and slow going. <laughs> it was so, cool seeing well, pictures of the, of the three of you guys all together. Yeah, so that was, uh, for anybody listening, that was the first time that uh, myself, Justin, and Leon had all met in person, which was pretty crazy. Pretty cool. Yes, they soon decided that I would soon be exiting the show. I think that was the major takeaway from the meeting. Um, sad to say, but, you know, maybe they'll let me stay a little bit longer. Hard to tell. He's on probation. <laughs> <laughs> so... Let's throw it over to Leon this this week, who's going to talk about This Week in the Web in two minutes or less. Leon. Thanks, Justin. Um, so first of all, Danny uh, has created a small uh, dependency injection implementation. That's what he's going to use to help kind of explain how DI works and kind of demystify it a little bit, which is really cool. So go and check that out on GitHub. Um, and at CDS, they announced web.dev, um, which is a new site to help developers learn about and adopt industry best practices in their apps and websites. So I really recommend you go and check that out. And also, um, the 2018 State of JavaScript Survey results have just been published. Um, and there's loads of really good things in there. But a kind of nice thing to take away from it is that um, compared to the last few years, developers are actually a lot happier with the state of frameworks nowadays, which is really good to hear. Um, Ionic has just announced an official preview for support for Vue.js. So that's really interesting. So go and check that out. Um, they've published a, a, blog, a blog post with all the details there. Um, and just finally, um, all the talks from Chrome Dev Summit have been made available on YouTube. So there's loads of really good content in there, uh, great content around best practices, performance, um, and all of the new web platform features that are up and coming. Um, and we'll, of course, be doing a, a recap episode very soon. So keep an eye out for that. And that's everything from me for this week in web. Thank you, Justin. Thank you, Leon. So you decided, uh, Danny, just as enough, just a dependency injection, just because, just, just randomly at the airport? Yes, I had a very long layover <laughs> in the <laughs> airport, and I was bored. So yeah, it's actually, it's actually something I've been wanting to do for a little bit, because um, as folks know, I'm a big Angular fan. Um, and one of the things that folks tend to have um, an issue with coming into it is uh, kind of the how magic dependency injection works. Um, so uh, I wrote a small dependency injection implementation. Like I said, it's like 50 lines or something like that. It's really not complicated. But but it's, uh, I think, maybe a bit more straightforward. Um, and then I'm hoping to write a, a, a follow-up post that explains, like, oh, this is how you how you would build it. So maybe it makes um, a bit more sense to folks. Ooh, can I jump in really quick? Does it help answer inversion of control? Because I feel like that's what NG2 did that kind of threw me for a loop. I was like, why does everything have to go in this big old pile? <laughs> What's well, a... Uh, so kind of, yeah. There, there, there are no um, unknown provider errors that happen. But, um, but yeah. But so if anybody is interested in that, uh, you know, please go check it out and give me feedback. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to. I'm, I'm not going to publish it as an NPM package or anything. I strictly want it as, um, I strictly want it as like a teaching tool. Um, and then, uh, like I said, I'll hopefully have a follow-up post to it uh, shortly. Nice. Yeah, I feel like my layo layovers are never quite that productive. You know, <laughs> if, I, if, I, if I get a tweet out, I feel like I'm doing pretty good there at the airport. But alas, we're not talking about airports today and how you manage your layovers and coding abilities. Today, we're talking about VisBug, and uh, we have the man himself straight from the CDS stage, Adam Argar. Adam, welcome to the show. So good to see well, you. Uh, bye, Well, always wanted to do that. It's been 10 years. Been waiting. Okay, it's done. Well, you can, you know, you, you got to bring it around every decade. That's the key <laughs> because, you know. You need to confuse feel like the whole new generation. <laughs> <laughs> what is he talking about? What are these frogs? This is stupid. It, if, if only there was a tool to look up these magical ancient advertising videos. Uh, so, Adam, uh, for those out there who don't know you, tell the, the the listening community out there a little bit about yourself. 
Sure, I'm currently a UX engineer on Google Cloud Platform, uh, and that means I kind of sit in between you know, PM, research, design, dev, and I help connect them together, whether it's through prototypes or little demos or breakdowns, and uh, it's been a delight. Uh, I've had a history of building apps. I've, you know, I've got 10 plus years in the industry, and it's kind of exclusively been building websites and applications. Uh, I've pretty much deployed an app on every platform, uh, and I love just building UI out of all the things in the stack. I just like making something that's tangible for my mom. You know, I'm like, hey, mom, look what I did. Touch this button. She's like, ooh, wee, you know, it did the thing. And I'm like, yeah, that that only took, you know, hundreds of man hours to make that button perform. <laughs> uh, it's all good, though. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm in the web, love the web. And, um, yeah, that's a little, little background on me. But that's mom's button. And now you can make a custom element just for mom. I should call it mom or button for mom or something like that. And be like, look, you have a tag now, mom. It's a good idea. Oh, Christmas. Okay. I don't have to buy her anything anymore. I'm just going to make her a web component. <laughs> now, do you print that? Do you print that code on the inside of the card? Or is that just, you know, it, you know I, I, basically, is this a punch card style web component? That's what I really want to know because I figure like the box is key here. Like it's all about the wrapping. Should be. It's almost like you know when you you bought a girlfriend a star when you were sixteen. You're like, I bought you a star. <laughs> you're like, hey mom, I bought you a web component. Like, what does that mean? I don't know. You got a piece of paper and said it's a shirt. So. <laughs> <laughs> so Adam, you were just at Chrome Dev Summit. You were in the keynote. The actual keynote the of keynote. what has become a very large sort of, uh, like we talk about Chrome, but like basically every browser vendor is at Chrome Dev Summit. There's a lot of interaction there. And there you were on stage demoing VizBug. We have the magic Royal happened. <laughs> Say what, Eric? I said we have royalty here. Oh man, no way! I've had I've had half a second of royalty. I mean, there I'm not famous at all yet, but that was crazy. The keynote, right? I was, uh, I I just gave a demo to Dion like four or five months ago. I gave him another one last month, and I got a ping about a week before, maybe maybe two weeks, and they're like, "Hey, you want to be in the keynote?" And in my head, I'm like, "This is a psycho thing to say yes, and it's a psycho thing to say no to." Uh, and I chose to say yes to it because I felt like out of the psychoness. Of anyway, whatever. Uh, the better choice was to say yes, and I took the risk. And the demo gods have blessed me. Uh, it makes sense. I gave them a very healthy sacrifice beforehand of, uh, um, you know, Fresca and other things. So, so how? I mean, how many bugs did you have that week before? Because I can only imagine that going. Oh, okay, I got to be in the keynote. Oh man, I wonder what bugs could pop up. Were you just sitting there in triage mode, going, "Hey, you know what? <laughs> this bug right here has got to die right now. <laughs> it has to go away." <laughs> Man, no, it's like, so VizBug is so weird. It It's really stable for for what it does. Um, it's kind of simple under the hood, right? Like the DOM is the source of truth. So it's not like I have state issues or anything else. It's all just chilling right there. Um, more of the, like the demo was like, okay, I got to not um, mess around like publicly because there was a temptation to dig in, there's like a couple of really rich things I wanted to demo, like going into mobile responsive mode, finding some typography that was poor, like nested deep into this like animated div. It's totally doable, um, but I didn't want people to see me, you know, struggling on stage or being finicky with the DOM. I wanted it to very much look like point, click and tinker because the goal wasn't to show how richly complex this thing is. It's more to be like, look, I did some really dumb stuff. I made it so you could double click text and edit it. I made it so you could drag an image on the page. It's like my pitch wasn't, this is the next best design tool. The pitch was, uh, do you have any, ever, ever wanted to do simple stuff like this? Um, here, I made a thing. It it does simple stuff and it does complex stuff, but let's talk about the simple stuff because I think that's that's more interesting to me. It's like, who who have I enabled to participate in the web now that used to feel like they couldn't? It was, it was more about like, yeah, enabling people. So, so why don't why don't you give us the pitch for this book? So, so first of all, it's it's a dev tool to help with 
to um, to help designers and developers or whoever really. But so, but what is what is the you know like the uh, Amal always talks about the the value proposition. So it's like what is the pitch that you give for like why people should look into this? Sure, it's a great question. Um, I I have like a list of eight things that are to reply. So I'll just do my best to like pick off the ones that have been most important to me. One of them is I wanted something that worked with your DOM today. Um, and that comes into like this conversation where we've got all these really amazing design tools coming out, but that basically your designers have to wait till your devs are done with the Legos. Uh, and those Legos honestly aren't going to be really ever done. And if you've ever been in production, it's like nothing's really ever done. You might throw it over the fence to another team, but so it's done to you, but it's not done to them. Anyway, the Legos are constantly evolving. So it's, there's this weird position everyone's in, like how long do I have to wait until my Legos from my dev team are ready for me to go pull the levers and play with, right? You got Framework X, um, pretty much every framework is coming out with a design tool. And I was like, that is so weird. Why is everyone investing so heavily in these abstractions? I mean, I get frameworks, um, I get it, but at the same time, no framework has ever lived a, a really long life on the web. Uh, it's going to be replaced. And so I was like, I want to go invest in the DOM. The DOM is super powerful. Everyone avoids it like it's scary and painful and bad and slow. And it's actually fast as crap, super capable. In fact, it's the only reason any of these frameworks can do anything cool is because the DOM is so dope. The DOM is dope. Alliteration. Anyway, okay. And so anyway, I wanted to empower people to be able to play with the DOM. The DOM is, uh, <laughs> thanks, Eric. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh, I, I work with React on a daily basis. Yeah. And so, so like, I don't get to talk about the DOM too much, you know, or else I get shunned. So. Yeah, I feel you. So that, yeah, I wanted, I wanted to empower designers today so they didn't have to wait, you know, and that's kind of what's fun about Visbug. It's like, what framework did you use? Don't care. <laughs> hey, what framework? Don't care. Uh, I called it punk rock on stage. Um, and, and, you know, and that's part of the, don't care attitude. It's like, look, is there Dom? I'll show you uh, what's there on the page in this moment. And so it's kind of fun. You can get the page into a really interesting nested state where you've done some crazy stuff and then you launch the tools and you design there. Um, I don't know. A lot of it seems really obvious, but um, I don't know. I don't know what I really did different other than I, I wanted to make something really simple. I wanted to simplify everything. It was, it was a goal of simplicity, just kind of across the board. That and I really wanted to enable and empower designers and PMs to go in and vet. Like, here's another example I like to say. Devel developers get this beautiful bow-wrapped package from design, right? Design's like, please, please, would you just implement my design? I I I've given you Zeppelin files and I've redlined and I even made this style guide and I made this document and it's like, I've really, really prepped. <sighs> And I just want you to like fulfill this as close as you can. Like I know what usually happens. I usually get like a Franken turd back, but you know what? I really want it to look nice. So here's the beautiful package of like goods, please implement. And then the devs go, hey, I'll take your package. And I see some bugs already in it. You know, like they immediately go into like, which is good, right? Cause they're, they're trying to turn it into a system, but it's just this weird relationship where you have this like person giving everything and then you have a person taking everything. And so designers have been, just in this position where once it hits the web, uh, they're powerless. All they can do is go back to their artboards, recreate what they see and nudge and then give you something new. And I was like, that's not fair. It is, there needs to be a relationship in reverse. Like why don't designers have tools to inspect a dev's work? Why aren't, why aren't designers making more decisions? They, well, it's because they're always in X, Y, abstract, different environment land. Or if they're in these new tools, they're in new X, Y, abstracted land, whether it's React or Vue or Angular, or whatever it is this framework is abstract. I'm like, I just want them to be able to go here and, and get their little idea out because when I sit down with them, all they want are margin and font size changes. Like, this is dumb. Why? I understand the dev tools is just a little too hard. I mean, you open it up, but it does look like the hood of a, under the hood of a car, right? You're like, well, there's the engine. Well, I'm not touching that. Um, anyway, and so I wanted yeah. something to really just lower the bar of entry to the dev tools empower people so that the product excellence can grow and so that something could help a conversation between designer and developer. Like I have this dream where like the designer's like, hey dev, I'm trying to do this thing with this bug, um, but my margin isn't working. And then the dev can come over and be like, ah, let's talk about margin uh, overlap or what's it called? Margin collapsing, right? And all of a sudden the yeah. dev are like communicating 
in harmony over the dom and they're like learning about each other's work and i don't know that was a long spout of a whole bunch of stuff but, uh, that, that's the best pitch for anything i think i've ever heard ever that was brilliant <laughs> really so good. With, with working at google though like sorry sorry leon but like working at google you're, you're kind of uh you're, you're kind of lucky in a sense too where there there are a lot of different types of teams there's like ux team right you said and and you're sitting kind of in between them. So you're in a rare, not unique spot, but a rare spot to really make a difference between that. Um, how do you um, ensure that these teams are kind of in sync? Because a lot of times if you're in a mid-sized to a large company, you know, different teams will have different priorities, even though you're working towards the same product. So on product teams, you'll have like UX, you know, they might not even, I, I mean, I've been in a lot of places where they don't even do mobile first, right? Where, where they're you know, just handing you Photoshop or, or in this, I guess now it's not even Photoshop, it's more sketch. They'll hand you like a sketch that's just, um, you know, fully baked, everything's in there except any type of behavior or consistency with that. It's just all visual. And then they'll like build it. And then there's, then there's the opposite where you get people who want to really implement uh, lean UX, but each team is in its own silo trying to build towards this one larger project. How do you how do you kind of manage that, and does this tool kind of leverage you know Visbug? Does Visbug kind of leverage anything to get those groups together? What a great question! And yeah, that this is part of the problem space that Visbug was looking at. So there's, uh, let's talk about feedback loops. You know, a value can come in the form of just simply shortening a feedback loop. Now. Uh, per your question, teams uh, collaborating, um, teams working towards a similar goal, but sort of working on an island. Um, Visbook can help you inspect another team's work. So, for example, a designer um, could be looking at another team's style guide. So here's something crazy. GCP is humongous. You know, there's hundreds of engineers, hundreds of designers that are on this product. Pretty much each tab in GCP is like a whole team. And um, they have a hard time communicating. I mean, even though we're at Google, like people communication is really difficult. And so you have often what will happen is one team is looking at another team's custom components and a designer can only go to the spec site currently. So there's a limitation of what the designer was even able to glean or understand from the page. And they would go to the spec site, which is essentially a style guide. Uh, we have a nomenclature issue in our in our industry right now, which is like, we have style guide, we have design system. There's one more word that all are so branding brand, brand style guide, right? So it's like, right. Okay. So we have three things that are almost the same. Like one is like, well, I'm just the colors sort of, uh, maybe I'll go into buttons. And the other one's like, well, I'm like hardcore. I've got components, but I've also got colors. So designers are currently going there and pretty much long story short is designers can now go straight to production. Um, and that closes a huge feedback loop because they can go inspect the values that are in there, whether it's font size, the font family, the colors that are being used. They can pull them right off of the end product instead of waiting for someone to go populate the style guide, which is almost always behind. Right. And so that's kind of part of the this is the feedback loop is so many things are behind because code is the source of truth and everybody's chasing the code. And so designers will chase the code with their design files. After the after you've hit like V1, designers start making artboards that emulate production so that they can reproduce a bug, empathize with it, and have the tools to solve it. And um, that's one of the feedback loops the BizPug can shorten. Um, you don't have to maintain another artboard. Um, you can just use production. You can go redesign something in production, take a screenshot, and make a Jira ticket out of that. You can even pin the styles over top of your modifications to make a Jira ticket that's like, look, I modified prod. Uh, here's the styles I changed. Uh, would you please implement? It'd be really great. Uh, so anyway, there are many feedback loops that are shortened by Vizbug. And honestly, I'm still discovering what many of them are. I'm maintaining a list, uh, but I'm interested to hear how other people are finding that this is taking a task that normally might have been one or two days and is either allowing them to do it in the moment or do the task in just a couple minutes and ship the results somewhere else. Is that list uh, public or is it just for you right now? Um, it'll probably go in the blog post I'm working on. Okay, excellent. The, the, I had another question on that too. Like I think you brought up a really good point that a lot of companies uh, suffer from, which is um, like a style guide will be built out, right? But 
it's really an implementation of a style guide. It's a set of code components that just, you know, you're expected to just regurgitate them into your into your app. Whether it's React or web components or whatever, it doesn't matter as much. It's more of, um, uh, there's, there's a lot of problems with that system. Like I'm really struggling uh, here actually with trying to get um, like a, a consistent con experience across our applications because a lot of our designers won't, that they, they won't give us any information about their designs until it's finalized. And so what happens with that is you end up with a set of components that are built by the devs that are basically word of mouth back and forth with one designer and one developer. And then, you know, as things change, they don't change in there in a timely manner. So some apps are updated and some aren't. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of companies that'll have just an implementation and not necessarily like, like if you go to material IO, right, you'll see a whole design section that describes behaviors. It describes, you know, um, how, how much pixel, pixeling and padding and percentages you would need between things. It doesn't tell you use HTML, use React, use web components. It yeah. tells you the high level designs and that's consistent. And I think a lot of, there's this big fear in a lot of design groups that, uh, hey, I give something to the devs and they're gonna treat that as this is production. We have to do it exactly this way. And I'm hoping some tool like this will help with that. Interesting, yeah, I am of the opinion that um, the source of truth isn't your implementation, which is a, a gentle recap of like some of the stuff you're saying here, right? Your React components shouldn't be your source of truth. They're an implementation of your design system. Exactly, yes. Um, and I have, I, uh, I had another product that I tried to start at Google. I'll probably try to attack it again at some point, but it's essentially trying to pluck the essence of your design system out of the implementation, put it somewhere higher level so that basically you can track implementations against your the soul of your system. Um, That'd be cool. So I have pontifications on this <laughs> that we could talk about later. But yeah, this is a really difficult thing. Um, here, Vizbug can pacify some of that now in that you can treat production as a sticker sheet. So a lot of designers now, they'll make a design system, they'll build a bunch of series of symbols, they'll create a sticker sheet, and that's how they build a page, is they'll go pull these things over. Well, you can do that with Vizbug. Um, I had a couple people that I demoed it for, but it's a really powerful demo. You open up the same page in Vizbug, page tab one, tab two, you go to tab number two and you hold the delete key and you just blow the DOM away. Well, you've imported all the dependencies. So everything's there to render some markup properly. So now you go back to the tab that isn't destroyed, you go grab something, you hit Command C, you go to the other tab and you paste it. So you can paste, uh, it feels like a sticker sheet. You're, and, and what's good is uh, BEM and isolation strategies like Shadow DOM and stuff work really nice here where you can take a whole Lego uh, from production and stick it in another tab so there's there's ways that you can use production as your new artboard that could help you stop chasing, that could help you. Basically, I think my pitch here is, is that in terms of the feedback loop that's happening, designers can go straight to production and use that code as a sort of source of truth for their new design updates. Um, so they wouldn't have to go maintain a whole other one or wait for the Legos. That, anyway. It's good. There's a lot of room there. So we've already started kind of talking about some of the real great benefits that a tool like this provides. Um, um, but before we kind of get into too much detail and, and start talking about some of the other benefits, there's probably quite a few people listening that won't have uh, watched your videos uh, from CDS or actually been to CDS yet. So could you try and paint a bit of a picture about kind of how this tool works or kind of visually like uh, what, you're, what, you, what it allows you to do as a designer uh, in prod, for example? Good call. Yeah. So, okay. So developer tools, people don't use the Chrome dev tools to build their website. They use them to poke and prod and understand and, and tweak and tweeze and tween and all these other fun things. Uh, and I wanted a design tool to do the same thing. So Visbug is not a competitor to Sketch, just as dev tools is not a competitor to VS Code. What it is, is a complement and it helps you uh, look at the result of your uh, authoring environments in the end environment to sort of help you well, visually debug. And so the first tool that it launches with is the guides tool. 
and it uh, went into the page and you launch the tool, you can hover on anything and it does the same thing that a lot of people did with like a ruler extension. Or what I would do is, is like a piece of paper, I'd go find a piece of paper and I'd hold it up on the screen and measure. So the guides tool gets rid of that task. It has um, some future things it's gonna do like show distance between two elements um, and some other kind of cool things. The next tool is the style inspector tool. And this is because there was a common task uh, through some user research and observation. I noticed that designers often just wanted colors and font size and like some basic styles off of an element. Um, whether or not they were double checking or they wanted to be inspired, uh, they just wanted to know these values. And so the inspector tool, you select it and anything you hover on, it surfaces the styles that I believe designers want. So instead of it being every style, uh, I created a filtered uh, list that says these are the ones designers are interested in. So you'll see just those. Again, trying to tailor it towards an audience that's got a task. Uh, so similar to the style inspector, there's also an accessibility inspector. And when that tool is chosen, anything you hover over tells you tab index, aria roles, uh, anything that's pertinent to accessibility should be surfaced there as well as I think its most valuable feature set, which is color contrast. And now the color contrast is just a hover away. Hopefully PMs and designers and other people can start to get in there and be like, hey, we noticed that there's going to be a large set of our users that can't even see this text. Can we bump up? Can we add some black or can we add some white and increase the contrast here? So there's the accessibility tool. Um, underneath that, we have margin and padding tools, which do exactly like they sound. They allow you to click one or many elements and change the margin of padding. Uh, and below that, oh man, memory, let's see. Oh, there's the Flexbox Align tool, which is essentially takes everything that you know about the Pathfinder tool and brings it to the web. So you select a container and use your arrow keys and you can change alignment from left to center to right aligned or top to middle to bottom aligned. Arrow keys, Flexbox, gone, use arrows. I made it that easy. <laughs> and you can also distribute with shift. Uh, underneath that is the box shadow tool, and then there's a position tool. The position tool is crazy. It's the one that's like, look, I know you were trying to learn what the DOM is and what flow is and how these things all work together, but how about you just grab one and move it? Because sometimes we need an escape hatch, and sometimes I'm not trying to work with the system. I just need to execute a vision. And so the position tool lets you go in there and just go nuts. Uh, underneath that is the typography tool, and then there's the text edit tool and the search tool. Uh, the typography tool lets you change font sizes, kerning, letting, all these sort of things. Uh, and then the search tool lets you programmatically make selections. So you can click things or you can search to click things and then modify them. So essentially to recap, what this tool does is it you launch it on any web page in the entire world. In fact, I realized recently you can go back in time and launch it on pages from 30 years ago, uh, which is also really cool. But anyway, you launch it on a site, and it's and it basically is almost like you loaded up someone else's really well organized artboard. Everything's named very nicely. You have to sort of discover what's happening because it's someone else's file. And after you become a little bit accustomed to how things are being arranged, you then have tools to let you modify, and change, and tweak, and tweeze. And so, uh, kind of the world is your oyster. But it's a lot like the dev tools in that your changes are ephemeral. They will be gone when you refresh. And there's gentle ways in the moment to let you get your work out. And we can talk about that later. Maybe it's one of people's biggest concerns. It's like, how do I get my work out of there? Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's the world's first open source web design tools built with JavaScript. Um, I think it's the world's first. I don't know. It's fun to say. So I'm going to keep saying it until somebody uh, smacks me around. We'll see. <laughs> So I have a question when you keep, so you keep referring to them as design tools and you said like, it's not a competitor for something like sketch or, or something like that, but is there, is there an output to this? Um, is it something that you do? And because right now I do that with uh, some of the designers here, but we'll just like, we'll open up uh, just plain, plain old Chrome dev tools and start moving things around and adjust that. Is this meant to, to make that process easier or facilitate that to be better? Or are you actually expecting um, designers to go and design something and actually have some sort of an output, like whether it's you know like a vanilla CSS or HTML or something like that to send to uh, developers who can then reincorporate incorporate those values into their, you know, into, into their projects? Yeah, that's a really good question. So, and I hear this is, um, man, there's like a multi-part answer you know, these new design tools that are coming out are very much about getting your designers in the system, 
right? So developers are going to build these Legos. These Legos have a bunch of walls. Um, then you give those Legos to designers, and designers can now design within the constraints of the system and contribute to the system, um, which is similar to what you would do sitting down with a designer side by side. They would make a request. You would find the appropriate class name, tweak it, and hope it didn't push something else on the page around that you had to make an exep exception like in your design system. But you'd be there sort of translating their thoughts and their desires of modifications on the page into your system. I love that sit down moment. And I love the idea of designers getting integrated into the system. And I think there's a lot of designers really interested in doing that. But at the same time, I was watching my brother uh, who's learning and, and just simple stuff on the web was really complicated for him. And the dev tools seemed so far away, but Photoshop was really close to him and he was very powerful there. So I wanted to, and, and then, you know, that sit down moment that I had with designers, it just, at the end of the day, as much as I love it, as much as they needed me, which is nice to be needed, right? Like developer, please again, right? Like fulfill my dreams, which I love. Uh, and I, and I would do that for the rest of my life, probably. I think that's one of my favorite things in the world. But at the same time, it's a synchronous interaction. We both had to be there in person, find some time, which meant that the time between that designer getting it out of their head and getting it into some code uh, was dependent on us meeting together. Then uh, some of the changes that they wanted, since I was trying to integrate it in the system in real time, you know, they would want changes that were exceptions to my system and they would be frustrating for me to implement. So I'd have to like scratch them down and be like, I'll do this later. And so I wanted to close that feedback loop. I was like, why don't I just give them the tools to do this themselves? They can do it asynchronously, immediately. They could, they could have been doing this since the prototype. Like we didn't have to wait till prod or till staging to like do these changes. We could have been doing it early. Uh, and then the other thing too was is, I'm watching, you know, there's a lot of designers here that are like waiting for Legos. And I'm like, that sucks. I mean, it's really exciting that some Legos are going to come down the pipeline that like give you powers and you could know, do things with them. But at the same time, it sucks waiting. And so I wanted something that and those design system are, are pretty much the most complicated things designers are going to get into. Right. It's lots of moving parts that all interconnect. So basically, my brain went, I see what they want to do. I see where they're going, and I want to do something that is kind of completely opposite. I want to do something that starts out dead simple, that a, an eight-year-old can feel like is like, wow, look at this. I'm like having fun on the web. Like I seriously, in my head, I'm like, I hope there's an eight-year-old somewhere halfway across the world that is just like so excited because they can move things on a web page, right? If, just for one second, think about what that might be like where a web page was like behind glass this whole time and then you get this tool VizBook that shatters it and things are tangible. I just wanted people to feel some power like that, right? Okay, so then on the other spectrums, I wanted PMs and copywriters and content editors to be able to participate. They're not gonna get in to Framer X and super rad system design tool YZ, right? They're, they're just not. They're going to keep doing what they're doing, which is screenshotting prod, going back to the design tool, which is probably Photoshop or something, adding a bunch of white boxes that cover it up. So I did the opposite. I was like, look, they should be able to get in there now. Not So this is per your question about the system, like changing a class. It's valuable that a designer knows what a class is and can eventually get to a mindset where they want to do that. But at the same time, there should be a tool that lets them not give a crap. There should be a tool that lets them go in, make a change. This is what my brain and my eye wants, and I don't care about implementation details because you know who does? The dev. So here's another realization I had, which is, oh, this is an opinion, this is actually a strong opinion. I've been in production so many times that to think that somebody could give me some naive CSS that somehow magically is going to work in my system is just crazy. There's too many variables. There's too many build processes. I have environment variables coming down from Node into my SaaS, right? Like, they're not going to know about that. There's no way DevTools can somehow like unpack my source map and give me a valuable entry there. So that was my other thing was like, well, if that's so far away and that's just a hard thing to solve, why don't I just do the opposite? I'll give them something that tweaks the value now and then a developer can translate, which is, I think, something like they like doing anyway. Um, did I cover your question? I think so. Yeah. Yeah, no, ab absolutely. I think it's interesting that you bring up the notion that there there is a bit of joy involved with it, um, particularly for people who are not necessarily well versed in a lot of the things that 
we sort of take for granted either as designers who are sort of working in the field or as developers who are implementing those designs. Um, in particular, it, it's funny you mentioned kids because I actually showed this bug to some kids because yes. I, I had to go teach uh, some junior achievement students last week as part of just uh, things I do through like code.org and things. Um, the simple amount of joy that children and I think most people get out of being able to instantaneously change something that they see that they don't control on somebody else's web page is infinitely beyond what most people realize. I, I just I just don't think people see it. Um, I see it because yeah. kids go, wait, I can mess with the school's homepage and I could just like take pictures of this and then send it around. And they're like, I'm like, yes, yes, using this tool. And then you show like it, 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 it leads into a very nice progression of there are many things that you can do. Programming is not necessarily one type of thing, because for a lot of children, they only see it as the labs that they're doing, which are typically console style output, not the sort of visual in inclination that they often get. And a tool like Visbug, which uh, sort of simplifies a lot of those things, like you said, that DevTools does now, but in a much more uh, easy sort of uh, abstraction on top is just magic. Like it, it, it literally will. It literally brings them joy, and it's just yeah. I think it's. I think there's something to be said for that. I think sometimes we build tools that are much too obtuse, even for us <laughs> as people who use them and going. I built it, and I, I still don't want to use it, but I needed it, and now it works, and doesn't really make anybody happy. But this definitely does. I'm glad you brought that up. Um, our our industry is rewarding complexity almost entirely. Oh, and, for sure. Uh, you know, and I get it. I like complexity just as much as the next inch, right? It's sort of like the next challenge. Um, it's almost like why frameworks, as they get more obtuse and more abstract and harder to learn, we're almost like more addicted, right? We're like drooling. But here's what's weird to me, and as I want to push back on the entire industry and be like, look, complexity is fun, right? Our brain gets to chew and crunch. It's almost like we're a dog with a bone. But what is harder than complexity is making something simple. So I want to implore everyone that if you're truly addicted to complexity and you like the challenge, try to take something complex and make it simple. You'll find that that process is harder. It's harder to make it simple than it is to make it more complex. Um, so anyway. Oh, for sure. Oh, that's a very good point. It's, I think, I think you're spot on there. It, it, it is very difficult to make things simple enough for most people to use. And I think we, I think I, I agree with you. I think we, there is a problem that we have when we build a lot of the tools that we use today is that they are not accessible to a, a large portion of people that we think they are accessible to that yeah. they just do not. Un and again, who, who's to say they should understand, you know, we, we, we put a burden upon people to go, Oh, understand the complexity that, you know, took 10 years to build. No, it's your fault for not understanding. It's kind of a lame excuse. I, I I very much dislike that argument when it pops up from time to time. We've been telling designers that for ten years too, right? We're like, oh, if you want to change that, open up the dev tools. Uh, yeah, that's, no, and that's really not realistic. Fun. Like, I think it's again, it's silly. It's a silly thing to assume someone's knowledge. <laughs> again, ignoring the fact that most of our knowledge is hard fought and won, right? <laughs> Through yeah. years of, yeah. oh yeah, you're not supposed to use that prop, or oh yeah, don't do that because it's a performance regression. Uh, you know, I would, I would like simplicity. I, I enjoy simplicity. Yeah, I'm hoping that the the so the dev tools. I want them. I eventually want designers in there. I think if a designer wants to to execute something that's really rich. They're going to kind of have to go in there. And so that was part of my pitch to the Chrome team is I was like, look, this is a gateway drug. I was like, if you make some of this stuff simple, they won't be so scared. At least I, this is my hunch, is that they'll have enough power that they'll, they'll be satisfied until they're not, at which point they'll be like, you know what? I, I'm kind of interested in what's happening under the hood here with this tool. So how would I make some changes and go look? Uh, it's a little innocent, actually, my, my task here. And then they'll eventually just sort of build up. So I'm hoping that this helps people move into the dev tools because it lowered the bar barrier of entry so far. When there's right now the barrier to entry, if you're like a designer and then they're like, just open up the dev tools, they're like, like that climb is steep. 
And I'm like, all right, well, that's cool. Try Bunny Hill uh, and then maybe another Bunny Slope. And, and hopefully that, that gives you enough confidence to jump up and try maybe a, a deeper hill. Um, anyway, so I'm hoping that it's sort of like a, a little bit of a gateway drug. Uh, we'll I, mentioned mentioned yeah, designers sure. quite a bit, um, but I think this could be really useful for a lot of devs as well. I mean, you mentioned that the, the, you know, the dev tools is quite a high barrier of entry to designers, but I think for a lot of devs as well, it's quite, you know, Every time I open it, there's something new. I'm like, well, I don't know what that does. <laughs> and, and yeah, you know, it, it's relatively weird. difficult to um, to move things around and, and you know, tweak things really quickly and easily to see how how those changes will take effect. Unless you're looking at something really granular. So having something like Facebook, which like i you know, while we've been talking, I've just rearranged the entire uh, front page of Google.com, and that you know, that's great fun and really simple to do. So obviously, that's a silly example, but. Um, it, it's great to see that see how that could be really useful for you know even seasoned developers just to quickly you know you know change their mind on a design and just quickly implement it in prod or, or wherever really quickly and say ah that, that's worth me spending a bit more time to do it properly because it looks good so I think that also has a lot of application and for developers as well. You're right. There's a moment that I had where um, I uh, um, you know this is this thing was totally experimental. Um, it still is experimental. It's weird. It's a weird tool. Thanks for using it. <laughs> it's weird. Uh, there was a moment where I had a I had a CSS grid layout. I'm like addicted to grid right now. I'm just infatuated, and I had a layout, and I was using my move tool, and I was like just developing my move tool, and I was using it on a card that I was using as like a test component. I was like, oh cool, I can move the hero image up here. I can move the avatar down here. And like that's cool. But then I went to the grid, and I moved the way that I defined my grid was that the first child was getting a sort of sticky promoted. Um, spanning two columns and two rows. And then I had another element that's like position number five that was spanning some space. Or wait, you know, it wasn't that position was doing it. It was that the node was defining how much space it was. So it was like, this is a promote promo node and this was like a quote node. And what I was able to do was select one with the move tool and move it, which was super rudimentary, right? You can do this in the dev tools. Like you can grab a node and drag it to another position um, or you can go to your, you know, dev tool and you can move an, a line up and down in, the, in your code and try things out that way. But what's weird is apparently that was so much of a barrier that I never thought to do it very often. And I didn't realize how much joy I would find in just rearranging my grid. So what, what this little stupid moment that I had was is I, I grabbed my like hero node and I hit right to move it over a child and I watched as my grid changed and I was like, holy crap, this is like somehow very playful and really exciting and like sandbox feeling. Uh, and I moved it over again and I watched something shift and I was like, this is a better layout. And that's when my goosebumps raised up. I was like, holy crap. I, I like just discovered and a better design. Like <laughs> I like hyperventilated. <laughs> I was like, what does that mean to discover something superior? And then I was like, okay, what if I crunch my browser down? I was like, well, that doesn't look very good. And I rearranged it. I'm like, it looks better now. And so anyway, I had these moments where I was like, the playfulness is kind of an insane advantage. That the simplicity to just moving things uh, was, so I, I totally agree. It, at some point in your head, it's dumb and silly and, and it's fun. And then there's a whole other side of it, which is insane value like brand new, undiscovered, like untapped value. And I still, again, this tool is still surprising me with things where I'm like, that is really exciting. Someone came up to me the other day and they were like, I'm using this on my school's uh, homepage because I have to open up the dev tools and delete two things before I can submit a button. Now I just use VizBug. I pop it open, delete those things, hide VizBug, and I submit my form. Uh, and that and another person said in France, their government pages are so bad. They do that too. So we have people that are using this now to like fix a page, uh, not just play, but like correct behavior. Uh, anyway, it, it's very interesting. Very weird little tool. I'm glad you're finding joy as well. <laughs> I'm joy, so is un joy is I underrated. I'm sorry. It just is. It just is. <laughs> I, 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 it's underrated. Yeah. I, I think people, you know, the, again, like you said, like people are like, oh, it's hard. And like, I did it and yay. And I'm like, you could just enjoy it. Like, <laughs> you could just, you know, enjoy what you do again. Like, that would be fine too. Like, it's okay to have a little joy when you're doing these things. I agree. Yeah. Considering like what Leon was talking about, where uh, devs might use this, 
I mean, a lot of JavaScript developers really fear CSS. So I think a tool like this would be really helpful in, that, in those cases. I hope so. I think the Flexbox Align tool uh, alone will help demystify a lot of like what, what that tool does, right? The syntax is so different that sometimes it gets in the way of what it actually can do, and it's a very powerful layout mechanism. Now, because you're so passionate about this, right? <laughs> Not that we can tell. <laughs> you're definitely super passionate about this, and I love it. Um, is there plans to like look at other other browsers to put this into? Yeah, so I was hacking on it yesterday, uh, the Firefox extension. So right now, what's cool is the, the tool palette, as it's called, is a web component. So this whole thing is just a web component that gets dropped in your page, right? Uh, yeah, I'm just like a, I like playing with all the things. So anyway. Web so components, web, what are those? Right? Oh, man, they have offered really superb isolation of styles. Also, stuff. great Christmas presents. Great. Yes. Oh, right, I got to make a website right away, <laughs> a SaaS site that you can go buy a web component. <laughs> And print out, send it to someone. Oh man, that sounds like a Ponzi scheme. What's a Ponzi scheme? I don't know. It's a scheme. It sounds like a scam. Um, oh crap! I got I got derailed. <laughs> Where were we? Mom's button. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, so I'm sorry. The extension. We were on the extension. Oh, I got okay, okay, yeah, okay. so it. Since it's just a web component, it really doesn't have any rich Chrome integrations yet. Though there's a branch you can go look at on the Vizbug uh, PRs, where I've got a design tab, and a second screen experience. Anyway, so there's a the good news is the amount of work to get it into other browsers is very minimal. All they need to do is support web components. And I was looking at the Firefox extension yesterday. Um, I got it to mostly work, um, but there were a couple of issues. I had issues with my web component rendering. Um, nice, I like that one. Yeah, we'll maybe get it into Edge. Uh, I mean, really, I'm hoping the community can kind of pour things over if they really want it. Um, but it turns out that the hardest part of this porting over work is that the map that I made of like desirable um, CSS properties that designers want? The way that I was able to accomplish that is I had a key, which would be the, the like prop, let's say it's box shadow, and then a value. And the value that I put in my map was the default value. And that would let me understand if I was, uh, if I had a, something unique that a designer would want to see or if it was just the inherited value. Now, so my I've got this object now, it's keys and values, and the values are all basically Chrome's default inherited values. And what I've found is that Firefox has different ones. So one of the biggest things I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to go through one by one in each of these props, figure out what Firefox thinks is default. But I actually, uh, you know, do you ever have those ideas when you're in the bathroom? I had a really good one, which was that uh, you can, I can iterate over, basically I'm gonna make a div I'm going to iterate over the div uh, uh, and its CSS props and go just essentially pluck the defaults out of it because since it's just a div with no styles yet, I'll be able to discover the defaults and in one loop, I'll generate this hash map uh, on the fly per the browser and get rid of this whole dependency thing. So Firefox should be coming soon. I'm really excited about it uh, and I see links pop popping up. I'm stoked. Okay, yeah, please help me out with this problem. You all nod in your heads like, yeah. How'd you not know that was coming, bro? <laughs> no, it's awesome. It's coming. I want it in all the browsers. This isn't a Chrome tool. Now, that being said, Vizbug is has no alliances, right? It's punk rock. Show me Don. I'll inspect it. But um, what I plan on doing is is building properly into Chrome Dev Tools what Vizbug cannot do at all. By Danny. It's nice seeing you, man. Um, I want to build into the dev tools um, a lot of these features natively because there's things I can't do right now. Like I can't remote inspect your Android device and offer Vizbug tooling remotely. And I really want that. I really want to be able to remote inspect and see a bug as a designer and redesign on device. Be phenomenal, right? Um, but I can't do that right now. I can't launch a Chrome extension on your browser, on your phone. I'm holding my hand up, everybody. Like I've got a phone in my hand. I can't launch it there, and that's sad. There's also things the Chrome DevTools have solved that are really hard for me to solve. Like when you click an element, I put an add event listener on there, right? I did add event listener click, and I said use capture true. That works on all sites unless you used capture. <laughs> I can't capture your capture, but you know who can? DevTools. And they've already written all this logic to basically intercept those events. Don't let them populate into the DOM and blah, blah, blah. 
um, the color picker tool. There's like a lot of stuff that I want from the dev tools because it's better. And so that's my efforts going to be uh, for the next little while is bringing these design things into the Chrome dev tools properly, doing it at a quality level and a, and a, and a feature level that just couldn't be accomplished with this add to any page strategy. Um, so yeah, we'll let, you play too. we'll let this one fly free. We'll go over here. That was going to be one of my main questions. So uh, for anybody who doesn't know, it is a, a Chrome extension at the moment. Um, so do you think, have you got roughly any any idea on, on how soon we might start seeing it properly integrated into Chrome DevTools, or is that just too far out at the moment to really say anything? Uh, it's not too far out to say. Here's something fun. When I, I pitched Paul Irish on this like five months ago or so, uh, and I had a really dinky demo. I, it was like margin padding and fonts w was all that I was modifying. Um, but that would... But still, my demo was like, hey, look, I'll, I'll hit the M key to switch to the margin tool, and then I'll hit up, and I'll add some margin to the top of this node. And he was like, okay, this is cool. So then an hour later, after our call, he sends me a, uh, so they're called CLs here, change lists. This is like a PR. He sends me a PR to the Chrome browser, like he already implemented margin and padding in DevTools proper with my hotkeys and everything, which means you saw the orange and yellow appropriately as you, or green and orange as you see padding and margin. It took him an hour to get a couple of the, the things in there. Um, so I think some of the harder parts are gonna be like politics and moving people around and getting things approved. Um, the dev effort, I think is gonna be really small. Um, so my, my prediction is that you'll see a lot of features show up as soon as we can get the whole ball rolling. Um, and my goal is to get the ball rolling. We're starting research. We're going to start all this stuff. Uh, and I also have some plans on helping the dev tools be better as well. So um, I am switching teams off of Google Cloud. I'll be joining the Chrome team uh, as Web DevRel, be a CSS and UI guy. Yeah, uh -huh. it's going to be really cool. My new boss is Addy. Uh, that's crazy. I had a dream come true. Um, but yeah, I, I, I want to say within a year, something interesting is going to pop up. And there's even things I can't talk about that are crazy exciting that, uh, well, we'll just have to do another show on them or something. They're going to be really, they're, they're very unique. Um, and it's like, that's a brilliant okay. idea for sure. Cool. Um, yeah. There, there's so many other things that would have been great to talk about, but, um, we're probably going to run out of time for this episode, but is there anything, um, that you can talk about? that you like any of your future hopes or future plans for VizBug um, um, that you can share with us? Yes, um, two things. This is a great finisher because everyone wants to know how to get your work out. So I want to talk about that really quick. Um, really rich ways of getting your work out of there are being thought of and researched. We're very concerned about that, but we want to be uh, careful about who well, not careful is we want to basically appease two camps. You have your developers that say, how do I get the code out? And that's not the question designers are asking. Designers are saying, how do I get my design out? So the idea is that we have this uh, way for designers to sort of select an element and publish it to Envision or publish the page to Envision, publish the page to gallery. An integration that then further blurs this line of production can be your artboard. Furthermore, we go into a developer strategy where how can we richly make a diff? How can we diff the markup and how can we diff the CSS to give the developer something that's a nice, tasty little bundle? So those are hot on our minds. Um, I'd just like to leave you with that. And then that we're thinking about these things uh, really richly as well. And we want to, we want again, this, this feedback, loop, feedback loop, we want to close it up. It's too long. Let's, let's tighten it. So, um, yeah, stay tuned. There's just tons to come. Plus, the GitHub issues uh, is full of features, and um, man, some of them are really cool. So go jump in there and go see about what's uh, what's coming down the pipe as well. Fantastic. Well, I believe we're just about out of time. Adam, is there anything we forgot to ask you? Anything like they're like, oh, we should have talked about this, but just totally went off track. <laughs> Uh, no, I mean, th there's just too many cans to open. You know, like we didn't talk much about inclusive design or chaos design. Uh, just how how this you can simulate latency with the dev tools, you know, and and then almost 
design in that intermittent loading state, you know, if you make it pause long enough, you can sort of modify it into any way. So there's, and then you can slow down animations. There's just so much additional richness that I want designers to feel like I have so much power now and I can empathize so much with my users across the world. Like now I'm not just designing in my super rad MacBook on this ginormous screen. I'm actually designing within the constraints in this little window on a mobile device in production with you know, session and state and all this crazy stuff just stacking up and I'm, and I don't care. I'm just looking at the result and I'm nudging the result because to me, that's all that matters. Um, I guess I did have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, what I'm hearing is more episode titles. That's, 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 that's what I'm hearing. Well, Adam, thank you so much for coming on the show today. If people want to reach out and find you, where would they find you? I'm on Twitter, Argyle Inc. That's I-N-K at the end. Uh, and I'll be sharing tons of Visbug updates there, as well as uh, I tweet all the time about web, uh, just building stuff and fun gifts of me building. Anyway, I'm just constantly chatting and building. I just love the web. So if you're interested in that stuff and you like uh, seeing little, if you like seeing optimistic people talk about the web, <laughs> go ahead and follow me um, at Argyle Inc. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Eric, yep. Leon, closing thoughts as we wrap up episode number 176. Just that everybody should go and check out um, this book. Obviously, we've not had a chance to cover all of the great stuff it does in the episode, but just go and play around with it and you'll soon discover some awesome features. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd like to thank you. I, I'm, I'm hoping you win this battle. It is a hard one to fight. <laughs> yep, so. Phil, I got it, though. Um, I feel like it's worth fighting. It is worth fighting for sure. Um, yeah, I want to definitely hear more about it. Um, you know, as far as uh, you know, the updates and, and getting more episodes with you on them, so that we can we can hear about all these other cool things. Good setup. You got yourself booked for a while. So, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you guys. I appreciate it. And this has been episode number one hundred and seventy six of the Web Platform Podcast. Today we've been speaking with Adam, talking about Vizbug, talking about how awesome the web can be. And remember, we're fighting for the web, just like you are out there. So tune in next week where we fight for more things web, more things platform, more things great for your end users. Thank you and have a wonderful rest of your week.